long before the internet was ever riddled with slime videos, these guys were doing cooler stuff with slime than we ever will. Meet the gastropods. These soft-bodied, torted, sometimes detorted, sometimes shelled, members of Phyla mollusca, which include all living slugs and snails, have adapted their slime or mucus to suit a variety of fascinating needs, ranging all the way from reproduction to locomotion. In this presentation, we will be discussing what is mucus, the variety of mucus glands that can be present on a single animal, its role in locomotion, the importance of slime trail following, the variety of ways in which different species have adapted their mucus to suit their unique behaviors, and finally, how humans are now benefiting from mucus ourselves. What is mucus? Well, it turns out, like most things in biology, it's mostly water, about 91 to 98 percent in most species. The rest is mostly either carbohydrates or proteins. The two main proteins are either mucins or lectins. Mucins are comprised of a long polypeptide backbone with numerous branching chains of carbohydrates, which can account for almost 80% of the mass of the mucin. Lectins, on the other hand, are small proteins that bind carbohydrates. Together, these two help sort of create a meshy structure, which give mucus a lot of its sticky properties. Aside from that, the rest of the mucus is either like small bits of metal ions, enzymes, and sometimes even chemical messengers. Gastropods can also alter their mucus in response to environmental factors such as humidity or salinity. Now it turns out not all mucus is made equal, and even within a singular animal, multiple forms of mucus are produced from separate mucus glands. In the slug Limax flavus, researchers have identified up to 14 different mucus cells. These different mucus producing cells can be found around the dorsal surface, the foot, the head, and the pneumostome, or the breathing hole. The different kinds of mucus produced from these different glands also had different properties such as acidity as well as protein and carbohydrate content. The mucus produced on the dorsal surface of the slug was more acidic and served to help protect the slug from its environment as well as desiccation. The mucus found on the foot was more neutral and was there to assist in locomotion. Meanwhile, the mucus on the head was more so so it could stick to food particles and assist in eating. This shows that different kinds of mucus is specialized for its role within the gastropods, and that different kinds of mucus serve different roles. Speaking of locomotion, it's also mucus which allows slugs and snails to have one of the most unique forms of movement across all animals. Using various mucus glands on their foot, they excrete a thin layer of slime underneath them. Muscle waves then propagate through the foot, and at different points when different parts of the foot make contact with the slime, cilia on the foot makes direct contact with the mucus, and this is what helps propel the animal forward. It turns out this funky style of movement isn't that energy efficient and is actually about 12 times more costly than the energy efficiency of running in humans. But what's interesting is that most of this energy expenditure is actually from mucus production rather than from the muscle waves that travel through the foot. Gastropods are able to minimize this energy expenditure on mucus production by having their mucus be a sort of sheer thinning liquid. Shear thinning liquids are a type of non-Newtonian liquids, meaning that whenever a shear force is applied to the top layer of the liquid, it deforms and the viscosity decreases, and so the mucus actually becomes more liquid as more shear force is applied to it. This shear thinning quality to their mucus allows them to sort of reuse the same mucus for longer, needing to produce less mucus in the first place. This cool form of locomotion also comes with some advantages. Whatever the mucus can stick to, so can the animal. And so slugs and snails can travel completely vertically. They can also cover sharp objects in their slime and travel over them unscathed. Increasing the calcium carbonate content of their mucus also allows it to become more fibrous and elastic, and some slugs have been observed using their mucus to scale down objects Spider-Man style. Leopard slugs take this to a whole new level and incorporate it into their mating. When two slugs fall in love with each other, they rub their mucus all over themselves before dangling from a branch in a helical shape. They then transfer sperm to one another and the rest is history. Even the hardened trails of mucus left over from movement are incredibly useful to many species of slugs and snails. They can use their cephalic and inferior tentacles to determine the directionality of trails, and tracking is a huge part of slug and snail behavior. Some species will follow their slime trail home after grazing every day, and this helps them conserve energy as so they don't need to relay a new trail every time. Other predatory species will follow the slime trails of other species to then eat them. Leeches will also do this too. 
Most species can also distinguish between the slime tails of different species to determine if they're a suitable mate. They can also gather information such as whether or not this potential partner has a parasite, their size, and their fertility. Finally, some species will even just eat their own mucus to help regain some lost energy or to eat food particles that have become trapped within it. Now that we've looked at the general trends of gastropod mucus usage, why don't we take a look at some of the more specific ways species have evolved their mucus. The mucus of many abalone species contains the neurotransmitter GABA, which also helps induce the settlement of their larva. Moon snails, like the coma necklace shell, feed on other mollusks, and the mucus they produce has a chemical activity on the other mollusks, which prevents them from opening their shell and escaping as the moon snail drills into them to suck their juices out. The violet sea snail excretes a mucus, which hardens to form air bubbles. The snail can then use this to create a raft from which it floats from the surface of the ocean. The mucus of many terrestrial snail species has also been shown to have strong antibacterial properties. For example, the common garden snail has been shown to have antibacterial effects against E. coli and many drug-resistant strains of P. aeruginosa. Within the mucus of a giant African land snail, the proteins acacin and mitimicin have been found to have broad antibacterial effects against both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, including S. aureus, P. aeruginosa, E. coli, and B. subtilis. In vivo studies in chickens have also shown that mucus from the giant African land snail has both anti-inflammatory and antioxidative effects. The moisturizing properties of mucus have also turned it into a target for big skin care and the current evaluation of mucus-based cosmetics products is over 500 American dollars as of 2022. But this is by no means a new fad. The ancient Greeks were known to crush up snails into a slimy paste to apply on skin for both wound healing and other skincare related needs. While using mucus to treat skin is certainly nothing new, using mucus to treat cancer certainly is. In a study, Researchers found that mucus from the purple dimurks had cytotoxic effects on two human cancer strains, while at the same time leaving normal human cells completely alone. Now, will mucus be used to treat your cancer? I can't tell you. But what I can tell you is that considering all the ways gastropods are able to use their mucus for reproduction, locomotion, protection, and feeding, mucus is pretty cool. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching, and stay slimy, everyone.